You know what my favorite book is? Pilgrim's Progress by John Bunyan. Hmm. And that's who we brought in today. John Bunyan? Oh, crap. It's, no. <laughs> it's John Branyan. John Branyan. And he wrote the book almost as iconic. Life is hardy har hard. It's more of a bathroom reader than, a, than Pilgrim's Progress is. Probably. Ew. Well. Yeah. <laughs> So a peculiar instance. So we're recording this intro in the future from back when we recorded this uh, this interview. And on the day that this interview happened, John actually traveled quite a distance to get here to be on the show. Uh, he was excited to be on. And on the day, the, Kyle's car broke down like in Palm Springs or something. Yes. Which is not that far away. He could have gotten an Uber if we're going to be honest. <laughs> But, uh, I tried, and it was going to be... You know how much it was going to be? And I had... Well, $900. Company expense. $900. <laughs> really? $900? Yeah, it was a $900 cow. Wow. Train. That was my first plan. But uh, my... So my leg... And I had a fresh blood clot in my leg. It was like at the peak of its pain. So I was like... I was in severe pain during this interview. That's why I was sitting on the other side of the table. And so Dan filled in. So Dan's here. And... Uh, in this interview, he's there now, but, um, but in the interview, he was here. So we talked about joking and satire and comedy as a weapon. Should I pretend to be Dan? Yeah, do your Dan voice. <laughs> yeah, uh, Soli de Gloria, man. No. He's not. He's not amused at all. <laughs> so without further ado, here's me and Dan. Oh yeah, and you can look up John Branyan epistemology on johnbranion.com and his book Life is Hardy Har Hard and you can see the interview now does anyone have a Guinness <laughs> that I can have <laughs> did I do good did I do a good job <laughs> oh hello there wait a minute what's going on Ethan's sitting in Kyle's seat this is weird <laughs> this is weird this is the weirdest episode of the Babylon Bee interview show ever cause uh, Kyle's car broke down so he's not yeah. here. So I'm not Kyle, for those of you who have already noticed. Well, yeah, you're not me. And I'm not you. <laughs> and I'm in your chair. You're in my chair. I've never you're sat in over Kyle's here. Kyle's chair. Yeah. This is all backwards. And then this is uh, John Branion. John Branion, who, who's here. a comedian. Who's also not Kyle or Ethan. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I'm sitting over here because my leg is propped up because I have an, a blood clot in my leg that is like painful. And so I'm on all these drugs, right? Or this pain drugs. And so, if I just kind of zone out in the middle of the interview, it's not you, John. It's me. Well, it's also not the first time that people have zoned out <laughs> while they're interviewing me. I'm completely used to that. If you fall asleep, okay. I can still handle it. Perfect, because I might. We're, we're off to a good start. This is good. Yeah. <laughs> I like this. So, John Branion, comedian. Mm -hmm. um, you're from? I'm from Indiana. Indiana. The mecca of comedy. <laughs> Indiana, yeah. So people always, people always ask, you know, Indiana. I don't know anyway, Indiana. Right. It's like it's like Canada. We don't know anything about Canada, and we don't know yeah. anything about Indiana. It's <laughs> just a, What's in Indiana? I don't even know. There you go. That's right. That's all. Well, you I'm not trying. Try, right? Is there like a race car there or something? <laughs> there is. Uh, there are many race cars <laughs> there in May. <laughs> <laughs> you do Indiana. a thing called the Indianapolis 500. Is that the same thing? It's not important. It what? doesn't happen in California. As non-Indiana guy, I think, wait, Indianapolis, that might be a whole different place. I don't want to. I'm actually impressed that you, you, you knew a sports thing. That's pretty good. Mm -hmm. I just want to yeah, take a second and pretty good for recognize me. that. And he did it under the influence of heavy narcotics. <laughs> yeah. That's right. I'm pretty good. So we wanted to get connected with you, John, because it seems like we have a lot of things in common. We do have and, many things in common. And yeah. I actually was, uh, I actually forced you guys to have me come out here. You forced kinda, our hand. I did. I kind of <laughs> made a, yeah. kind of made a jerk of myself um, to get out. The reason persistent. I'm sitting in this chair is because I would not take no. For I admired answer. his persistence. Mm -hmm. And you guys actually got e off easier than other people have oh, gotten yeah? off because I can tend, I know exactly how to be a royal pain. I know how to be unignorable. Squeaky wheel. Yep. Squeaky wheel gets the grease. Uh, a few years ago, I decided that I wanted to be on Letterman's show. Oh, wow. You did. You pulled that off? Uh, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> An attempt was, was made. It was harder to wear him down than it was you. 
But here's what I did. Okay. I, I got a bunch of postcards printed up that were the top 10 list of reasons why I should be on the Letterman show. That was the thing that he did. And so it, I, I don't remember all 10 of them, but the number one reason was because I, and then there was a place where people could write their name in, think he would be a great guest. And then I distributed those postcards at my shows, and, and there, were, there were thousands of them. I distributed thousands of postcards, and I said to people, I want you to take one for yourself and some for friends and whatever, and just hand these out at church and have people <laughs> sign them and put a stamp on them and mail them in And so on, on this date. And so they did. And uh, I got a call from the producer of the David Letterman show, and I was not expecting that. I yeah. picked up the phone, and it's like, hey, this is, uh, this is Zoe. Producer of the David Letterman show, are you the guy sending us sending us all these postcards? And I said, <laughs> Yeah, I probably am. If you're getting if you're getting a lot of them, and uh, she said, Well, you need to stop because because <laughs> it's not going to work. And I said, I said, Oh, contraire, Zoe, uh, you're talking to me on the phone, are you not? <laughs> And she said, uh, you need to not send us any more postcards. And I said, well, this is bigger than you and me at this point. I have no idea. I can't just shut it off. And so, um, long story short, I got a rejection letter from David Letterman show, and it's mm. framed in my office. <laughs> It's a badge of honor. You're a fan of rejection. Yeah. You know, we noticed that on mm -hmm. the back of your book mm -hmm. titled Life is Hardy Har Hard. Mm-hmm. You have some real one-star reviews on your on the back do. of your book. Those, uh, those reviews I, I garnered, yep, those are actual reviews that, uh, <laughs> that are on Amazon from people who haven't read that book. They haven't read it, they just, <laughs> right. oh, from a different book years? Well, they just, no, they, they, from a different thing that I did. They just okay. loathe me, but that book has, is not the reason that they loathe me. And so, Should I read some? So you've got you you've got just haters that follow you around, mm -hmm. and whenever you put out something new, it's like, oh, I gotta put I, a one star on this. I have amassed haters from much the same way that you guys said. That's why I wanted to come and yeah. talk to you guys. We have things yes. in common yeah. because I'm a piker compared to the number of haters that you guys have. <laughs> you Wait, what's a, a piker? We're gonna have to. Bleep it's a that guy out. from Indiana. <laughs> <laughs> Is that a bad word? We're going to yeah. have to bleep that out. Guy who lives in Indianapolis. Awful author. Could could probably get better advice, for, advice from a second grader. Terrible comedian. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't give a negative star rating. I would if I could. That's brutal. It is, un it is unfortunate. That's so okay, brutal. this one's rough. The only thing funny here is the author's sad, pathetic life. <laughs> oh, <geez. laughs> so that's something I didn't yeah. know about you when we booked you. We didn't know that you had this much hate surrounding you <laughs> I that, have that, that's a big sell for us well <laughs> <laughs> I should have led with that shouldn't I <laughs> Should have started with that rather than the comedy angle. I should have said, so, I have a lot of people that hate my guts. So what are you saying out there that's causing that kind of a reaction? I'm curious. Um, I say, like you guys do, I say true things. And yeah. if, if you say true things in a manner that is entertaining and uh, particularly satirical, you know, you'll get in trouble faster than if you say true things and nobody's paying attention because the because <laughs> the thing about comedy is that it makes people pay attention to you. When you're funny, people will listen to what you have to say. And when they listen to what you have to say, the people who don't want you to say that get angry because they themselves are not funny. And so people aren't listening to them. And so in order to get people to listen to them, they have to they have to go to your website and write one star reviews about your book. So, <laughs> that's all they can do. Yeah, they, if you can't, because, yeah, that is the thing. Humor gets people to pay attention. Mm -hmm. It has strength to it when it makes you laugh. It's disarming. There's power behind it. And if you can't compete with that, funny-wise, then it's more, it does seem like you have to either go to the route of outrage. Mm -hmm. You have to do something. You have to get people worked up in another way, right? Right. That's the most popular right. response That's is the outrage. That's outrage. Yeah. yeah, humor seems to be disarming because it's just... You, you have to respond in kind. You can't, if you just react to it, then you've, you've already lost, right? Well, it's also an involuntary response if you laugh. That's what makes comedy so great is, you know, there's no, nobody's like, you know, you go to like a, like a speech or like a, you know, whatever those things are that professors give because my brain is <laughs> shut down right now. I can't Lectures. talk. A lecture, you can act like you really got something from it, but like. You know, you can kind of fake laugh, but like there's an in involuntary response that like, you know, the crowd doesn't lie. Like if you're funny, you, 
you get yeah. the response. Mm-hmm. So well, and and but that that point uh, that you just made, even though your drug-addled brain doesn't know it, um, <laughs> is very profound and important um, <laughs> because it is it is a a response that we have to to humor um, that is not. You can't help it. When something is funny, then something is funny. Mm-hmm. And that was actually the, one of the impetuses for writing this book is the idea that um, comedy – I used to get the question – I still get the question uh, after shows. People go, how do you think of that material? How do you think of that material? And my response used to be, oh, no, I don't know how I do it. <laughs> and a few years ago, I started thinking, you know, I really should have a better answer than that. I should have some idea. Meth. How I do this. Yeah. <laughs> Psychedelics. Um, <laughs> And so I started thinking about, well, how do you write material? And that was where the book came from. And the mm. first thing that occurred to me is um, that that comedy is not actually created by human beings. Comedy is created by God, and it's sprinkled throughout the universe. And all we do is discover it. Yeah, all, all creativity is created by God. We discover it. Right. right? Yeah. Right. And so, but, but that has implications, for me at least, and for, and for you guys, I hope, that it sort of takes the pressure off. It takes all the pressure off, really. Because when you laugh at something, that's not, that's not your fault that you find something funny. It's actually God's fault. And so, <laughs> so every, every offensive thing that the Babylon Bee has ever, has ever published oh, man. belongs at the feet of God. <laughs> And if you guys, the devil are t- has any plan? Any, no any jokes. No, because because um, because evil doesn't know how to be funny. Humor is it all belongs to God, and it's humor is the the way that we get through suffering. Because God knew that there was going to be all kinds of suffering and hardship in life, and He had to give us some way to respond to that evil. And it's comedy. Hmm. And the people who are who are wicked. Um, they try to do comedy, but it doesn't have – it does not have the same effect. Yeah. Because they don't have um, – they I, – I read an article um, that was published by – and I should have written it down, but I didn't. I didn't come prepared with that. Um, <laughs> but this guy uh, was basically saying that comedy – he said the same thing that I'm saying. He says comedy is a weapon. But he went on to say, because he's he's not a Christian person, he went on to say, but – but you can use that uh, that weapon um, to harm other people. You can you can use it to to hurt people who don't deserve to be hurt. And he's incorrect about that because the same humor, a robust sense of humor, not only can be used to expose truth and to and as a weapon, but it also is a shield. It's a suit of armor. And when you understand how comedy works, you don't get your feelings hurt. You're not. People who have a robust sense of humor have never been offended by anything you guys have written. Um, right. Because, because that's what humor does. It, it enables you to hear things that would offend um, mere mortals, but because you have put on this, uh, this comedy cloak, um, it doesn't hurt your feelings. <laughs> I don't get offended anymore. Hmm. It does seem to put up a barrier between if you're just spouting your mouth off and saying things. Comedy, that's one thing I like about making satire articles is like, I'm not, we're generally not aiming our joke, even if we're bringing up an actual person, we're usually aiming our joke at a satirical version of them. Right. It's not them personally, but even we're making a a joke about a idea most of the time. And uh, so it is, it is different. It's different than if you just called a person out and said something. And there's just always that safety of, well, it's a joke. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Calm right. down. It's a joke. Right. But, but, but the reason what separates a good joke from a, from a not good joke is, is the truth. Mm-hmm. And so if you say a thing that's true uh, and it's funny, then all bets are off. It, it, right. it's, it's funny. And if you're offended by that, well, you're going to have to do – you're going to have to do better than just being offended um, mm-hmm. by the truth. And we have a, a culture in, in church that sadly doesn't understand that when people are offended um, at you guys or at me um, for saying something that was a, that was a joke, um, 
that that's actually their problem and not our problem because um, we don't get to decide what's funny and we also don't get to decide what's true the truth is also out there and it's either once it's discovered there's nothing you can do about it and it doesn't do any good to be mad at it mm -hmm. um, it's like being angry because water is wet it's like okay well that's I'm sorry I'm sorry that, but that's that's just the reality of it yeah, cultural Christianity has set itself up to not be able to be very funny because, like, to be funny, you have to say the thing everybody's thinking but doesn't want to actually say out loud. Mm -hmm. And the moment you say that thing, everybody's thinking it, you say it, that's what causes this relief, this laughter. Right. I remember talking to an atheist guy about, like, what is the explanation of laughter to atheists or to people that believe in pure evolution? He said the closest thing we'll figure out is, like, if a monkey – you know, is walking around out in the woods or whatever. Oh, no, the bunch of monkeys hanging out, cavemen or whatever, and they're sitting there. Something break. That was uh, Mr. McFeely dropping off our mail. Okay. Oh, the mail guy. <laughs> yeah. We need and, to put some uh, WD-40. It's so it's loud, really man, loud. our yeah. mail thing. It's like this house is from like the 20s. <laughs> uh, so the... So there's the cavemen sitting around, and all of a sudden they hear rustling in the bushes, and they think it's like a wolf or something. And all of a sudden, their buddy Thag comes walking out, like, "Oh, it's just Thag!" <laughs> so it's like a, a relief that I thought I was going to get killed, but I'm alive now. <laughs> but I think that there's a there is a connection to that. Like when you make a joke that like you said something that I thought I was going to get killed for saying, and we but oh, everybody agrees, and we're not we, we can laugh about it. Like it, it creates that it re, that relief. Right. So now the drugs are kicking in. I don't know where I'm going with that, but. <laughs> Well, they're relief because oh. you're the one that's going to get killed now and not them. It's the, well, yeah, it's the relief that, like, he said it, I didn't say it, you right. know, but I get to laugh. And also, uh, and so in church, we very much, cultural Christianity, we like to put all these soft boundaries up, all this, you know, cuddly pillows everywhere, bunny pillows and stuff to make it feel like uh, we're all being very nice. Nice is a little too much of a uh, value, I think. Uh, true is better than nice. Um, kind is good, but it's... A, so I think that we... Put up so many boundaries that you're only left with jokes like puns and like things that are like, oh, you know, uh, how did Noah fit all those animals in the ark? <laughs> he must have had to, who knows? <laughs> Put a I bunch thought you were going to tell us a bad joke. I was trying to come up with one on the spot. He probably had to shrink them or something. <laughs> He's still, wait, he's still waiting for the joke. He's like, where's the joke? He had to use a bunch of I butter. Like there was <laughs> butter. I don't know. <laughs> so it's hard. Butter those hippos. <laughs> Get them on the ark. Well, no, that's exactly right. If we have this idea that you can be funny, and cultural Christians think that you can be funny without, uh, without a barb somewhere, without, mm -hmm. a, without some edge, and you can't. There, right. there, there's no humor unless there's conflict somewhere. Uh, specifically, there's no humor unless, unless there's pain. And the pain can come in many different forms. It's not always life or death, but it has to be something that's awkward or uncomfortable or somebody has to get hurt right. in, in comedy. Somebody has to be injured. And I was uh, watching a video a few years ago on YouTube, and it was just a guy sitting out in front of the school, I guess, waiting to pick up one of his kids. And it was icy. And he's filming out the side window of his car as these kids are coming down the sidewalk off of the bus. And uh, there's a patch of ice on the sidewalk, and they're just falling, you mm. know, and they're throwing books and lunch boxes. <laughs> and it's just one kid after another coming down and he's kind of narrating. Oh, here comes another one. Oh, there she goes. And then down they go and their legs fly up in the air. And the comments underneath this video, it was like 10 minutes long. I mean, there mm -hmm. must have been 300 kids yeah. that fell down in front of this guy. <laughs> and uh, the comments underneath were from people going, why doesn't he warn them? Why doesn't yeah. he tell them there's a patch of ice there? It's like, because if he told them that there was ice there, they would stop falling down. <laughs> <laughs> That's a person who doesn't understand anything about how comedy works. No. <laughs> <laughs> So somebody has to fall down. Someone's got to fall down. And what I, what I am encouraging people to think about in the book is uh, being the one that falls down. Because um, we're all going to fall down at some point. And if when you fall down, it completely undoes your life and it ruins every aspect of your existence, well, then you're, uh, you're not really well-suited to, to live on this planet. At some point, every single one of us is going to fall down. And when you change your perspective 
to more of a comedy perspective, then when you fall down, you get to kind of rub your hands together and go, this is going to be a fantastic story. Yeah. I, I am so glad that this happened because now I can, I can tell my sister, I can tell the people at church, I can tell whoever about this boneheaded thing that I did. Um, and then they will do what? Well, then they will laugh and they will laugh at you. There's <laughs> people talk about, oh, it's okay to laugh with somebody. There's no such thing as laughing with somebody. There's only <laughs> laughing at people. <laughs> Let's just say that because that's what it is. We're laughing at people. We're not laughing with you. Um, I was having a conversation with a guy just this week who's been reading my book. And he's, he's exactly the guy that I would hope would read this book because he's, um, he's a Christian person and he's a very nice guy. He's a very gentle, nice guy. But he was telling me that when he was at work, he had a guy who worked with him who was a funny guy. He goes, he was a really funny guy, but he would say things and he would cross a line. You know, mm -hmm. he'd cross a line and it would really hurt. It would, he would say really hurtful things. And so I'm reading your book and I'm, I got to ask you, there's a line, right? There's a line where, where people shouldn't, they shouldn't cross that line. And I said, are you talking about that person crossing a line? I said, no, there's no, there's no line. If you're expecting a bully to suddenly have a, you know, a streak of conscience and he's going to go, oh, I probably crossed the line there. I shouldn't have said that because that really hurt that guy's feelings. If you're expecting that guy to figure out where the line is, well, he has all the power. He has all the power. You're at his mercy. What if he never, what if he never draws a line? What if he just keeps getting harder and harder and harder and harder? What are you going to do? See, so the, the, wise thing to do is to develop a sense of humor so that you can push back you know you can you can give as good as you get and that's where christians start to kind of get a little uncomfortable yeah. because they well that's is that what jesus would do um and i i think the answer is yes you know jesus had so many things that he said that don't translate well. You know, first century comedy doesn't translate well <laughs> to 20, 2021. Um, but he would say things like, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than a rich man to go into heaven. And my, uh, uh, my granddaughter was reading just yesterday about the rich man coming to Jesus and, and Jesus saying, well, you need to sell all, give all your money to the poor people and come and follow me. And Cammie said, to her mother, she goes, well, why would Jesus tell people, tell the rich man to give his money to the poor people so then they would have a harder time getting into heaven? <laughs> yeah. I think Jesus definitely had a sense of humor because, you know, you read his parables that he was teaching the people with and it was like, hey, uh, don't tell somebody with a speck in their eye when you're, you know, hey, you got a speck in your eye because you're walking around with a huge plank. Right. <laughs> I mean, he's like, the, his use of that, very that, slapstick. Yeah, it's just, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, and that's comedy. Comedy is this, is this grossly exaggerated contrast, and he just put his finger right on it. And again, it doesn't, the, the best way to destroy comedy is to analyze comedy and to talk about it, and so, which is counterintuitive. A lot of people think, oh, it'd be interesting to hear these guys talk about comedy because it's like dissecting a frog. You know, you get to start dissecting a frog, you can learn a lot about it. But the thing, the thing about dissecting a frog is you don't end up, what you end up with is a bunch of things that don't look anything like a frog. And this is the yeah. same thing happens when you take a joke and you start slicing it apart. You end up with a table full of stuff that's not funny. But when I dissected a frog in eighth grade, I, the knife slipped and hit it in the eye, and then all the eye juice shot directly into my mouth. <laughs> and I had to like just gargle. I just put my head in the sink. Like, <laughs> I was trying to do find the brain for extra credit. <laughs> that's my story. No, it's story time with Ethan Nicole. Did you? No, we can. <laughs> did you find the brain? I think I did. You were supposed to. You're supposed to very slowly scrape away until you find this little like patch of brain. You know. Mm -hmm. And that, that was the thing. I was slowly scraping away as over lunch break to, for extra credit. Find the brain. And it's like, zip. <laughs> <laughs> you should have gotten extra credit for tasting for the eye juice. For eye juice, yeah. <laughs> for science. Yeah. That's for science. way more yeah. interesting. You're probably the only person that knows what that tastes like now. So, What does it taste like? I, I mean, you know, whatever that juice is. Chicken? Formaldehyde or something. Yeah. Oh, gross. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Frog water. Yeah, so frog water. So frog you kind of talk about... Um, 
using comedy as a weapon mm -hmm. in the culture. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what, what are things in the culture that you see as needing to be pushed back on or, or to have a sword with? It's, um, there's a lot of things in the culture that, that we t do at the Babylon Bee, of course. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you're seeing the same things or... Yeah, well, most of the cultural things that you guys put your finger on, one of the things that makes the bee so great is that you that you know exactly what culture is talking about. And so those are the things that you talk about. Um, I think over that, you know, we can talk about the categories of things that we need to talk about. But I think the overall thing that culture is missing and by extension, the church is also missing because the culture has seeped into our church and... Um, and given us the idea that there is a, uh, for lack of a better term, a separation of church and state. And the culture has done a great job of convincing Christians that we're supposed to shut up about politics and culture because mm -hmm. separation of church and state, separation of church and state. So you can have your religion, but you got to keep it to yourself. And the, that is absolutely wrong. Um, the reason that separation of church and state exists is to keep the culture from damaging the church. It's not to keep church from speaking to culture. Because the truth is that every important thing that mankind talks about is religious. Politics is secondary. The most important things that, that people talk about, the things people really care about, are religious ideas. They're not mm -hmm. political ideas. Um, they're certainly not mathematical or chemical or, or physics-based. Mm -hmm. um, they're not science-based. It has to do with religion. And so everybody is religious. And the church, the Western church, cultural Christian church, has swallowed the idea that we need to keep our mouths shut because this is a religious thing. And my religious convictions have no place in the public forum mm -hmm. because religion is personal. Religion is, is something that we should, we should sit down over coffee and one-on-one -on -one we can have a conversation about that. And that's the correct way to do it. But I shouldn't go on social media and I certainly shouldn't publish a magazine where I express my religious views to the culture because that's not, you know, that's not appropriate. That, mm -hmm. that turns people off. That, you're, you're pushing people away from Jesus when you jam your religion down their throat. And I think that um, as a comedian, that's how I made a living for 30 years, was I jammed my religion down people's throats. <laughs> <laughs> right? Everything that I talked about, you know, my relationships and, and the, my job, every, everything, every aspect of my life is underpinned by my faith. And I didn't say that when I was standing on stage at the comedy club, but I knew that. And so the reason that people allowed me to jam my religion down their throat, in fact, they paid me money to jam my religion down their throat, was because I was funny. And so that's the gospel that I'm trying to preach to the church now is you guys have got to be funny if you're seriously <laughs> trying to share your faith with people. And if you're not willing to share your faith with people, if you don't want to jam your religion down their throat, then, then your religion must suck. Right? I mean, if, if my idea isn't good enough that I think you should have it, then, then my idea is not that good. Yeah. Why should you have it? Why yeah. should I have it? Yeah. 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 yeah you must tell me I not think it matters. That's the thing that I don't, I don't, yeah, people that think that, oh, I just keep my faith here and I don't want to impose on anybody. Then, like, you must not think it is actually consequential to reality, then, right? Right. <laughs> That's the thing is like all the big conversations that are being had about equality and racism and all that stuff, like, the real base question there is what is a human being and what is our meaning? And yeah. they're all, like you said, they're religious questions. And we think we can just gloss past that and talk about justice somehow. So what is justice for a bunch of morphing animal creature things that are just like at this particular state of evolution, but who knows what we're going to be at some point, at least some kind of rhinoceros octopus things at some point, <laughs> God knows. Right now we're just some horrific thing. We don't we don't know we're horrific yeah. creatures that look like some kind of amoeba that came out of the slime and like you know, we think we're humans, but so yeah, justice among some kind of meat bone things that walk around. Just the idea that like there's some idea that justice can exist there. Uh, we take it for granted because we have that basis of I guess we just we have the basis of a Judeo Christian uh, society that we live in, but uh, it's all taken for granted. 
Right. You know, there's that worldview where it's like, we all came from nothing. We're all just <clears throat> evolving states of matter. Right. And then someday the sun will burn out and the earth will be dead and nothing mattered. Right. And you're like, but human rights are very important. Human rights. <laughs> right. Human, by human, I mean right. this stage of past monkey. <laughs> Not monkey, but whatever this is. Right. Don't be on the wrong side of history. <laughs> you know, yeah. Which is everything dying eventually. Which, right. yeah. Which is everything. Yeah, everything that history is, is going to be the wrong side of history. <laughs> right. And, and so, if it, but yeah, that's exactly it. And, and that is hilarious. I mean, that is, that's funny that we've got these people who, who don't believe in God. They don't, and, and they'll, they say Christianity is immoral. Christianity is oppressive and immoral. But at the same time, you know, justice does matter. And, and immediately you guys see the problem with that. And that's the reason that what you do is important. Um, and you can tell you can tell when the message has been received when people get mad at you. You know, so every piece of hate mail that you get, every angry letter from Christians or non-Christians is them saying to you, I understand what you've said. Um, because if you don't get any, uh, if you don't get any hate for your comedy, then your comedy is vanilla and it's unremarkable. And so I have for years looked at, um, looked at criticism as validation that people are paying attention to what I'm saying. Mm. Because when they understand what I'm saying, yeah, it is offensive. I'm, I'm suggesting that there is a God um, and that you're not as good a person as you think you are. You know, the idea that, that we can met out justice, that we, that we have any idea how to be fair and equitable to human beings is ludicrous. It's insane. Mm -hmm. But when you say that, you ruffle a whole lot of feathers of self-righteous people who think that they know um, what's good for mankind. Hmm. And like you said, Dan, underneath that is the assumption that there is a God. There's a Judeo-Christian ethic that, that bolsters everything in Western culture. America exists because of Judeo-Christian ethics. And we just ignore all of that now hmm. and want to start with – um, justice and, and goodness and tolerance and inclusiveness. And none of those things make any sense outside of a religious framework. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that'll end up well. That'll go well for us. <laughs> you know, as time goes on, we'll see the wisdom of uh, just forgetting all that stuff and moving on. Um, I kind of want to talk a little bit more. You mentioned it at the beginning. Um, so that's comedy as a weapon, but you're also saying it's also a shield. Mm -hmm. And, uh, your book is life is hardy hard hard i'm wondering um how you see that shield and how that how that looks in your individual life or how that how that can be applied to my life because i agree life is hard mm -hmm. and i'm wondering what, what your views are on that like how, how does comedy help us through life when you um when you have the attitude and, and not just give lip service to it. I'm talking about genuinely internalizing the idea that conflict is a good thing because it's going to result in a good story. Um, that's what people want to hear about. When you if, you, if you go to YouTube, for example, and you look at the, the number of hits that a fail video has, you know, those fail compilations where people wipe out on their bikes and overshoot the swimming pool and they jump off the roof and all of that sort of stuff. Those have millions of views versus the views that people have at a commencement, for example, when they're receiving a diploma, when they're six, nobody cares about success. Everybody wants to hear about your epic failures. Mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's something to that. There's, there is a, a message that, uh, that is being shouted basically by the culture and the church is still, it's still not hearing it. We don't care about seeing you get a trophy. We, want to, we, we don't want you to put your best foot forward. I've got a, a beloved member of my own family who's like, I just want to put my best foot forward. I want people to see me at my best. Is that wrong, John, for people to just see me at my best? And it's like, well, they don't want to see you at your best. They want to see you fall down the stairs. That's what <laughs> <laughs> because that's what's funny, right? And it's not that people want to see you get hurt. That's not, that's not, but we don't have control over what's funny. Somebody falling down the stairs is funny. 
If you're going to watch a, if you're going to watch a video of somebody getting a trophy, or you're going to watch a video of somebody getting hit in the crotch with a football, there's no <laughs> question which one of those you're going to watch. <laughs> well, I think we but, see ourselves in the guy falling down the stairs. We we all know we're clumsy and yeah. You know. Yeah, I do think yeah, because you you'll get that criticism. I've I've heard Christians say this is malice, mm -hmm. laughing at somebody falling down. Yeah, there's a qu real question there. But I don't know. I don't. I don't think that I. I don't take pleasure in the guy's pain. No, it's the. Uh, it is. It's that like it resonates. You're. you're it resonates to it. with reality. Right? Yeah, we're we're all trying to do one thing, then suddenly a banana peel messes it all up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly. That's exactly right. That is exactly right. And and we don't have to apologize for that because again, comedy we didn't create it. We didn't make it funny. When people fall down, God decided to do that, <laughs> you know? And so what are we going to say? Is God unrighteous? Is he, is he wicked and evil and mean? No, there, we must be interpreting it incorrectly. If it's funny when people fall down, well, God is good. And so there's a goodness when you fall down. Hmm. And sometimes you get hurt and sometimes you bleed. And, and yes, now what all if of you that's put true. out the banana peels? What if you put out the banana peels? Yeah. There's some moral questions there, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, even if even if you put out the banana peel, that's still it's still funny when people fall down. It's true. And and so and that's where that gets back to your question. How how is it a shield? Mm -hmm. Well, if I know that Ethan is the guy sprinkling banana peels around, and and I'm the one who falls down. Um, well, is it funny? Is it? Do I think it's funny when somebody else falls on a banana peel? Yes. <laughs> do I think it's funny when I fall on a banana peel? No. Okay. So what's the problem with that? Well, the problem is I'm a hypocrite. The problem is I'm, I will acknowledge that it's hilarious as long as I'm not the one that's suffering. And so comedy becomes a shield when you realize, oh, if I'm the one that's suffering, it's still funny. Just because I'm in pain now and I can't necessarily respond appropriately, yeah. this is going to be a great story later. This is basically G.K. Chesterton's On Chasing Your Own Hat mm. essay. So play the G.K. Chesterton thing. G.K. Chesterton. Okay. <laughs> Have you read that, that essay? No. So he makes the argument that, like, you know, you're this proper British gentleman and then your hat falls off and suddenly you're chasing it around the park. You should be excited about the kind of the comedy and laughter and joy you're bringing the world rather than getting all upset. Mm. And, uh, the whole, the whole, it's a short essay, but we, I think we read it on, yeah, it might have been a subscriber I think portion. We did, yeah. yeah. We did, we read it. It's one of our favorites. But, uh, but yeah, highly recommended. It. It's a Chesterton thing yeah. about finding the comedy and even when you're a part of it. it talks about the guy who's like, his drawer is jammed. <laughs> he can't yeah. unjam it. So just <laughs> ima about, imagine there's some terrible dragon is holding yeah. it or something. And <laughs> you're trying to pry. Your, your life becomes an adventure. Ripping, yeah. You're trying to rip the sword of Excalibur out of the stone yeah. or whatever. He makes it super epic. And, <laughs> To get yeah. my socks. <laughs> it kind of became like a running gag around here. Like if someone's stressed out or having a bad day, it's like, yeah. oh, you're, oh, you're chasing, chasing your hat. Yeah. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> it kind of seems like, yeah, that 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 shield against despair. It's like you're you're trying to remind yourself that there's there's a truth or there's an objective arc to your life. That Correct. that stubbing my toe isn't the end of the universe. It's <laughs> there, there, that later on. When we get to the end of the story, the, it'll it'll we'll look back and it'll be funny, right? Right. Yeah. Whereas, well, and, it, whereas if you're like in a secular perspective, you don't really have that. It's just like right here, right now, this sucks, right? And it can't be funny, right? Well, and and they're wrong about that for the same reason that they're wrong about justice too. I mean, from from a secular perspective, how do you determine what sucks and what doesn't? How do you say what's funny and what's not? You can't make any declarative statements of any value without some sort of religious um, underpinning. You can't, you, you can't say it's not funny when I fall down the stairs if you're a secularist, because on, on what basis are you saying this isn't funny? Mm -hmm. You know, what, what is your standard of funny that you're appealing to? And that's, that's when you have outrage because they can't answer that question and it infuriates them. And so they will, they will blame you for, causing them even more pain. And that's why 
Uh, it's important for people who deem to be funny, for Christian people who say, I'm going to use humor to proclaim truth, to have all of this, all of this hat chasing kind of under their belt so that when, when the people who don't understand what comedy's for and how it works come at you and they, they do come at you, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. <laughs> um, it's, it's difficult. It's, it's relentless. I mean, I, I've gotten, I've gotten it. Um, but you guys are in the spotlight. I've never had the New York Times write about me. <laughs> so, oh, man, that's um, so crazy. Do yeah. you see the latest that they, they kind of retracted their they tried statement? A slight retraction. Yeah, they're, they're a misinformation site disguised as satire. Right. And then the guy tags Seth and Adam on Twitter, and he's like, hey, I rewrote it. And it's like, <laughs> it still says the same thing. It's like, it's not, it's not a retraction at all. It's just exactly the same, but he slightly reworded a few things, you know. So we're still right-wing misinformation right yeah but it, now it's now it says disputed with snopes and facebook you know right. yeah. there's a little note on there but i think that legitimizes <laughs> their argument yeah right well but that that is like a it's like a wave crashing against a rock and eventually it does have some erosive power and it, it starts to it starts to sting after a while and when you you get the, the thing about criticism is that it always seems larger than it is. You know, the New York Times writes about you, and that has the, the possibility of creating in your mind this idea. It's like, man, the whole world's against us. Why are we doing this? Um, but it's, it's legitimate, even if, you're, even if you're the only one that's, that's standing on this truth. Um, one of the things I talk about in the book is that your sense of humor is like your other five senses. God gives you a sense of sight to see lights and colors, and he gives you a sense of hearing, he gives you a sense of taste, and he gives you a sense of humor for detecting comedy. That's, that's what it's for. And so when you detect comedy, that is legitimate. And I've heard people say uh, many times, oh, that's not funny, or this is, this is not funny. And you're just wrong. If a single person on the planet thinks it's funny, then their sense of humor is telling them that. And uh, my sense of humor, everything that I do on stage is what the, I think is funny. Everything that I write is what I think is funny. Because I don't know what you guys are going to think is funny. That, that's up to your sense of humor to determine that. I can't possibly write something you know, that Dan is going to think is funny. Mm -hmm. I just have to write what I think is funny. And then let the chips fall where they may. And some people get uncomfortable with that when they have a large group of people that disagree with what their sense of humor is telling them. But it doesn't make it illegitimate. It's, it's still legit. They're just wrong. They're just wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever had like a big epic bomb? Like you go up on stage and just crickets... Yeah, no, nothing well, happened. Not not a epic bomb. <laughs> <laughs> My career is yeah. built on epic bombs. <laughs> so yeah, I talk and then about you got you got off stage and you're like, man, they're all wrong. They're all well, <laughs> their senses of humor are broken. Later later on, no, in, in, early on, early on, they were not wrong. Um, mm. <laughs> uh, early on, they were not wrong because there's uh, humor has has rules there's there's laws of laughter just like there's laws of physics and laws of chemistry and you can't break those laws you have to work within the confines god created it and so there's there's ways that it has to work and if you if you break those rules then it then it doesn't work you don't have comedy um but there's experience teaches you what those rules are and then after gradually hopefully you uh you learn kind of you get better you get better at predicting what's going to work versus what's not sometimes it's not 100 percent, but it's hmm. it's a higher percentile than it was when i first started <laughs> you know i can kind of look at material and go okay this will work this won't work in this present form it's going to have to be adjusted um hmm. but it, it's it's all at some point you just throwing it out there and seeing what the yeah you know what the audience says yeah, that's the unfortunate thing about this day and age with stand-up comics is like most of the shows that stand-up comics do are supposed to be preparing and figuring out what material works for their big special or whatever. So like they're testing out stuff 
at their smaller shows, you know. But now everybody's re- recording with their phone, and these videos are going up online. And because I've learned, I learned just I just did one open mic night, and I realized like this is there's a there's a part to stand up comedy that can only be figured out and worked out in front of a crowd, mm-hmm. a huge part of it. So you have to be. It, that's why comedy always takes some f- level of bravery, unless you're doing really cowardly comedy. But because uh, you do have to throw a joke out there, you have no idea what the response will be and find out what it is. Right. Right. Well, in comedy, comedians specifically have have already said, I'm going to be funny. I'm going to stand behind this microphone and I'm going to make you laugh. People who I've never met, room full of strangers who doesn't yeah. know me, I'm going to make you laugh in within 30 seconds of taking the stage. It is a preposterously arrogant thing to do to get up behind a microphone and suggest that I'm going to make you laugh when you don't know me. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that's the expectation. Speakers have it much easier. because right. And if a speaker's funny, it's like, oh, we weren't expecting oh, bonus, that. Yeah. yeah, this guy's funny. <laughs> and if you, and then if you try to be funny and it's not funny, you can just pretend like you weren't trying to be funny. Yeah. You know? <laughs> the comedians can't do that because yeah. I've already told you I'm going to be funny. And so if yeah. I'm not, um, then they you don't, know. They don't really have just stand-up speaking, do they? Or spe- like someone well, just called speaking. Uh, Hannah Gadsby. <laughs> <laughs> Gadsby. Yeah. Well, when you talk about being part of the comedy elf, I'm reminded of this story from when I was uh, working at a gas station, graveyard shift. I had somehow developed horrendous hemorrhoids, and it was in Oregon, so it was raining like crazy. I had sold my car, even though I still owed a bunch of money on it, so I was paying off a car I didn't own. <laughs> And I had to walk home with horrendous hemorrhoids in the pouring rain. <laughs> and somewhere along that walk where I was doing this weird bow-legged, like, <laughs> Woody walk, you know, like Woody from Toy Story, and, like, grimacing and cr- clenching in the rain, somewhere along that I realized that there's something really funny about this, and I started laughing. <laughs> so I think I'm tapped in. I'm tapped into that. That's awesome. Yeah. So we're going to go to the subscriber portion and uh, put on our smoking jackets. Yep, subscriber lounge for uh, subscribers only. We're going to talk more with John. Um, I kind of want to get more into humor in the Bible. Okay. uh, Because that seems to tie into that comedy as a weapon thing. Maybe talk about Elijah. There we go. Uh, Do I get a jacket? You do get a smoking jacket. Yeah, smoking jacket. And uh, I I saw something on your blog about bad atheist memes. Mm -hmm. I think that'd be kind of fun to go over. Okay. <laughs> Anything you want to do, Ethan? Or? That sounds good. We'll Ethan's ask 10 like, questions. I just want to put my leg up and <laughs> I just want my leg and pass <laughs> out. Take some more pills or something. Ethan's going to take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Here guys. We go. Sorry. Free lo- freeloaders, we're kicking you out. Goodbye. Coming up next for Babylon B subscribers. So I, I, re- I really like this Richard Dawkins meme. We can throw it up on the screen. I have a theory about Ooh. profanity. Yeah. Let's, yeah, let's, talk let's, about let's profanity. get into profanity. Carmen antics. I don't personally have a story, but my brother does. Enjoying this hard-hitting interview? Become a Babylon Bee subscriber to hear the rest of this conversation. Go to BabylonBee.com slash plans for full-length ad-free podcasts. Kyle and Ethan would like to thank Seth Dillon for paying the bills, Adam Ford for creating their job, the other writers for tirelessly pitching headlines, the subscribers, and you, the listener. Until next time, this is Dave D'Andrea, the voice of the Babylon Bee. 